TheMarshallMan.com I'm recording this video live from an island in the south of Thailand and joining me on this call is Master Yap Bo Hiong from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Master Yap, thank you so much for joining me today and also thank you for sharing your knowledge once again with the people that are watching. So the focus of this conversation is going to be on the Yan Sao Gong, which for those of you that don't know is a set of Nagong exercises that derives from Southern Shaolin. Now, before we get into that, I think it's probably wise if we start to discuss the history of Southern Shaolin and just to give some context about what you have described before as Shaolin being somewhat of a university rather than just a place where martial artists would learn fighting arts. So Master Yap, if it's okay with you, I would like to start the conversation by discussing Shaolin as being what you describe as a university. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'd like to explain a bit more about Shaolin, see, because most people, to most lay people anyway, they think of Shaolin as only a center for teaching martial arts. But what I'd like to you know, inform people about it is more than just that, you see. Because uh, Shaolin has a very old tradition, as you know, that goes back at least 2,000 years. <laughs> and it's a center of learning, you know. Uh, and in modern days, it would be considered a university. And there's a center of learning that teaches three areas of knowledge. And those three areas are, of course, uh, Buddhism, philosophy, and attendant to it, you know, is the meditation and other practices. Then secondly, it also teaches uh, traditional Chinese medicine, okay? That means uh, the, the different <coughs> healing methodologies, including using herbs, uh, using uh, qi as a healing, acupuncture, and so on. And also, the third one, of course, is what is most known for, uh, martial arts, you see, as a center for training and learning martial arts. But most people are not aware of the other two, see, right? So, so I like to emphasize the point that it is a university and these are the three main subject areas that it actually teaches. And like a university, it would have levels of teaching, right? Uh, you know, and your first join is a monastery, right? So you, you are selected, you know, there is a selection process for you to get in. And when you're selected, you join at the basic level. And this, I well, you want to use the modern analogy will be equivalent to your bachelor's course, right? Your bachelor's degree, for example. And then once you get past that, you have acquired the skills, then you're eligible to do the master's degree and the PhD or, you know, doctor of philosophy uh, certificate and so on, you see. So it does have levels, maybe not exactly the same as the modern university, but it does have levels. So that's why when uh, what you see now of uh, modern Shaolin is basically the basic bachelor's degree. What they learn is a uh, very physical type of martial arts. That's why most people come away with the impression that Shaolin is external, uh, which is not entirely true, right? But then at the basic level, you learn the hard physical arts and you learn the so-called external Qigong, right? The use of the heart thing where you resist, you know, uh, body blows and you can do things with your head and your body and so on, you see. But when, once you get past that, you go to the next level where you then learn more about the healing parts, uh, also, of course, on the medicine, and then you start learning on the internal arts, you see, right? And of course, right from the very beginning, because it's a, a center of learning for Buddhism and philosophy. And for those of us who know more about Buddhism, we tend not to term it as a religion, right? It's more of a philosophy because we don't actually worship any person or entity. You see? It's more as a set of practices you do to improve yourself, uh, especially is to do, let's say, is, uh, to discipline and train the mind, right? So as you go further up, the levels of learning, then you begin to learn not only just the basic Buddhist practices such as chanting, but you learn more about the philosophy and the deeper levels of its uh, spirituality, you know. And when you reach the highest level, 
That's where you have all three levels or three types of teaching combined at the highest level. And that is traditionally what Neikong is all about. Because Neikong is not just about martial arts. It also combines the, you can say, mental mindfulness aspects of you know, training of the mind, the philosophy, as well as the healing aspects. So Neiko actually is the culmination of all the three areas, the martial arts, the traditional medicine part, as well as the spiritual and uh, <clears throat> philosophical parts. Okay, so that is exactly actually what Neiko is. It's not just about martial arts, and it's not just about using energy and chi. So having said that, then, as in a university, not every person or every monk that enters Shaolin Temple gets to go all the way up to the highest level. Just as, you know, out of your thousands of undergraduate in a university, perhaps you only have a couple, a handful who actually make it all the way to the PhD level. You see? So, so therefore, the teaching of Nekong and the knowledge embodied within Nekong it's not so widespread because not many people have made it all the way to that level. And even if they made it all the way to that level, these people, the so-called PhD can, uh, graduates, may not be teaching Nekong outside of the temple. If they teach, it's still within the temple. So it's very rare for Nekong to be taught outside the Shaolin Temple. And there are a few reasons why, you know, and therefore, you know, people say, oh, Nico is a secret and all that. But I don't think that was its original intention because it's just like any advanced, you know, uh, academic course. Uh, to be able to get to a PhD course, you must have certain prerequisites, right? You know, that means that you must have certain level of knowledge and a certain level of skill. And I think in Shaolin, it's not just knowledge, but also skill, you see. So if you're going to be doing PhD on martial arts, you've got to be good, very good at martial arts. Same as when you want to do meditation or, you know, energy work, then you already must have certain basics, you see. So because of these requirements or prerequisites, uh, not many people get to learn Neko, right? And therefore, it was hardly ever taught outside of Shaolin Temple. But having said that, uh, people or the benefits of learning Neikong, and later we'll talk a bit more about it, are pretty clear. You see, people, of course, you have the, uh, you know, better health, and you're some of the, a lot of the old Shaolin monks, they live until their 80s and 90s, and they're still active. They can still do things. They can still do sparring, you know at a very ripe old age, you see, right? They are not decrepit, you know? So, so you're not talking about living up to 100, but you're confined to a wheelchair. No, these guys are in their 80s and 90s and they can still do things, you see, right? So that, that part of it's important, the health benefits. Then of course, <coughs> uh, the energy benefits, right? If we talk about that internal energy, both in the aspect of health and healing, right? So uh, a lot of the monks, were actually healers, right? So they may have started out with martial arts as they progress up the ladder and levels of learning and also with their, I think, uh, spiritual training, right? Therefore, you learn more about compassion. You forget about the aggressiveness and the competitiveness, for example, and you turn to more towards healing, you see? So, so the healing aspects of it was also there, right? And of course, there's also the martial arts because like any university, uh, different students or monks may specialize in different areas. Some became very good healers, some became very good martial artists, and some became very good spiritual teachers. You see? So, so there's all these different aspects of it, right? So, but because of the, this uh, difficulty of learning Nekong, it was not widely taught. In fact, it was hardly taught outside the temple, right? And even if the monks who graduated at the highest level, and continue to teach Nekong, they would teach it within, within the confines of Shaolin. You see? So the so-called knowledge and tradition of Nekong was not widespread purely because of this reason. You, see? You, you need to reach a certain level of your own knowledge and skill before you can actually begin to learn this, these skills. Right? So, so that was it. But 
Okay, then this comes about. But because of the benefits of <coughs> Nekong, uh, news got out, right? I suppose there are people who know at all, you know, there's these practices that help you to, uh, you know, engender good health, a long life, and so on, you see? And there were powerful influences, right, that persuaded, you can say, Shaolin to teach these arts outside of the temple, okay? And of course, when you say powerful influences, this man, well, would normally mean the emperor and the court, the imperial court, you see? So because of that, a subset of the teachings of Nekong, uh, so basically the health-related parts, were then repackaged together, and that's where the label Qi Kong came about, you see? Because if you look at the traditional literature, there is hardly any mention of Qi Kong. Is always you're always talking about Neikong, you see. So Qigong is a relatively modern term which refers to a simplified version of Neikong that was taken out of the Shaolin Temple context so that it can be applicable to the lay person who hasn't got a very high level of training in order to learn it. Okay, so to me that is the main difference between Neikong and Qigong, yeah? So that's one thing. And the other part of it, uh, which later we can elaborate more on is, I think one of the most mm, important uh, difference or distinguishing feature you can use to this, uh, between Neikong and Qigong is that Neikong always has the martial art component, whereas Qigong may not, because that part of it was taken out because it's deemed as you know, uh, not, not needed for the context of which it was created, you see, right? So to me, that that component of Nekong uh, does not exist in Chico, okay? So that's it. Uh, that, that's basically what I want to say, yeah. So when you say the difference between Qigong and Nekong is that uh, Qigong is, is mostly for health. We could classify it as being yeah. a health art and Nekong has the martial art um, component. What what exactly yes. do you mean by martial art component? Are you saying that Nagong is its own martial art and a fighting style, or is it something that they can integrate into their existing art? Okay, I think what it is is that uh, Nagong will have the essence of most of the combative arts in there, not all, but the key elements. And the reasons why is because in the combat arts, right, uh, the key objective is to be able to use your body more efficiently, right? Be it to, uh, you know, jump higher, run faster, move faster, punch harder, right? Or strike harder. It's learning how to use your body more efficiently and also, of course, learning how to use the internal energy to, to, uh, to create these effects, so to speak. So, therefore... In the creation of the martial arts, these movements would have been optimized, uh, if you want to put it in modern terms, would be optimized for body mechanics. Yeah. You, the, the way you would move, the way you would you know, extend your arm and so on, will be a very precise and very efficient way of using your body, right? And when it comes to Developing your internal energy, it is these precise movements in the martial arts that actually help you to develop what we call your internal structures. Now, uh, that is a very loose term, right? When I say internal structures, is the parts of your body inside, you know, and this may be a combination of your fascia, your tendons, your muscles, and maybe even your nerves and your, you know, blood vessels and so on, based on whatever theory that you follow or how qi flows, right, or your meridians. So the exercises were meant to, you can say, align, connect, and stimulate your internal structures. So if you don't have these type of precise movements, and later on we can do some simple demonstrations to show that, then your journey, or you, you basically cannot kickstart the engine, you think, because things are not connected, you know? So it's like you have a, a rusty engine, a car you've left sitting in a garage for years, 
So you can't just start it straight away. You've got to, you know, take out the parts, clean it, make sure things are connected, the pipes are connected, the hoses are connected. So the same goes with your body, right? So due to lifestyle and so on, uh, yeah, all these things become misaligned or blocked. And the movements are there to help you to unblock, realign all the different components so that eventually then your engine can be kickstarted. And when you do that, then your internals will start to flow. So that's one, one reason why the martial arts part is important because it's the martial arts part that give you the precise movements. So it's not just, Qigong is not just about waving your arms about, but it's about moving your arms in a very precise manner. Because when you do that, it actually moves what is inside your body. Right? And later on, we'll talk a bit more about that, see the process of how Qigong works, so to speak. Now, the other part that is equally important is that in martial arts, you want maximum efficiency, you want maximum power, right? And hence, you must do the technique, right? And eventually master those techniques so that you can express it, right? Be it in a punch, a jump, or kick, or whatever. So one way to test how well you have uh, mastered your qigong, so to speak, right? Or neigong in a sense, is to actually have a pressure test on your, your movement. If you, let's say, you have a common movement or let's say just a simple structure such as this, right? Posture where you stand, you know, almost all qigong, neigong practices have this posture. But there are certain alignments that make your body connect up and other alignments that don't, you see. So if somebody were to push on you and you can't receive his force and later on return his force, that means that your structure is not aligned and the technique that you've been practicing is not right, is incorrect. So that's one way to test whether your technique is correct or not is by using these martial arts movement. Of course, if you're just interested in the health aspect of it, you know, uh, you're not going to ask someone to just shove you very hard like that. But if you're doing martial arts, it should work equally well if somebody shoves you very hard that way, you see. So the martial arts part of it allows you to test whether you're doing the technique correctly or not. Because if you're not doing the technique correctly, then you will not be able to hold the forces or you will not be able to ground the forces and you will lose your balance, you see. So I think that is also what is missing in a lot of Qigong because a lot of people do a lot of different, different movements, but you never know whether you're doing it correctly or not if you don't pressure test them. So I think for those two reasons, uh, you know, uh, martial arts is important. And I think there's also a third reason for that because in martial arts, one of the most important thing that you learn, even as a beginner, is about discipline and focus. Right, the perseverance and the determination, the discipline that you need in order to practice your art. So same would apply whether you're practicing qigong. You know, even if you're practicing qigong, if you don't have that discipline, you don't have that perseverance, then you're never going to get anywhere. You see. So the third thing that the martial arts brings over to the neigong part, you can say, is the discipline. You see. Yeah. So I think for that reason, the three things you know, in martial arts plays an important role, you know, in the practice of, and learning of Neigong. It's interesting when you talk about you have ways to pressure test if, if the positions and postures are correct, because I'm sure there's many people that are practicing Neigong or even Qigong that have no method of, of validating, you know, is the position correct and am I, am I doing this posture correctly? So it's really interesting that you talk about that because I guess it would give you instant feedback in your practice to know if the posture is correct and then you can continue on the right path. That's right. And I think that's very important. I think we have a saying, you see, if you practice 10,000 times wrong, it's still wrong. It doesn't make it right, you know? So it's better to do it right from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. That, I think that is a very important aspect. And I think that is the criticism being levied on the traditional arts because of you know, the node pressure testing. And then when it comes to a combative encounter with the so-called modern martial arts, they lose because they never pressure tested it.
themarshallman.com.